Today I'm continuing a series that I've entitled, In God We Trust. And I specifically made this teaching to counter the fear and the panic and the gross unbelief that is being put forth today about the financial situation, not only here in the U.S., but all around the world. And people have been talking about it, and in my estimation, they've been operating in fear, panic, dismay. Uh, They've lost their hope. Uh, There's been people that hadn't been able to sleep at night, and it's kind of understandable for an unbeliever who doesn't have any trust in God to respond that way. But what's really bothered me is that Christians are responding this way. And if you listen to Christian television or radio, a lot of them are talking about this situation and just presenting it like it's the end of the world. I've made this point from Genesis 26, 1, where it says there was a famine in the land besides the famine which was in the days of Abraham. And I really believe that the purpose of this being stated this way is to put all of this in its proper perspective. There had been famines before. There would be famines again. People had survived it. This wasn't the end of the world. And uh, I think that that is the very first step. Jesus told his disciples the very first thing he told them the night before his crucifixion, recorded in John chapter 14, verse 1, don't let your heart be troubled. You have to get hold of your emotions. You cannot be panic-driven. You can't operate out of fear. You can't operate out of worry, care, and all of these kind of things. And I tell you, there are people pushing the panic button today. And if you buy into that, well, then I guarantee you, fear and faith are opposites. They just don't mix. And if you are going to buy in and embrace the fear that is going so rampant in this world today, it's going to hurt you in your faith with the Lord. And so I really think it's timely for this message. So after it talks about the first verse, about that there was a famine and Isaac went down to Abimelech unto Gerar, then it says in verse 2 that the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Now I mentioned this real briefly but I want to make this point and make sure that this is, this is really driven home. Because here was a crisis situation. There was a famine. And, of course, in those days, they didn't have the social systems, the social uh, safety net that we have today. And, I mean, if people couldn't grow crops, if there was a, a lack of food, there were people dying. There, this was life-threatening. There were people that were losing everything they had. And so this was a serious crisis situation. I believe probably much more serious than what we see in our world today. And you just look at the way people are responding today. They are panicking. They are, there are people, I've actually read reports of people taking their money out of banks. You know, I get my reports from my ministry off the internet and I look at some of the headlines of the news uh, just to see what's going on in the world. And I've actually read reports of people telling you where they hide their money at home. People are taking money out of banks, thinking that banks are going to fail, going back to the Great Depression and seeing that kind of a thing. And uh, anyway, there's people today that are just doing what everybody else is doing and they aren't listening to the Lord. They aren't getting any direction from the Lord. They're just panicking. And they're, they're just doing something out of fear. I believe that Isaac, although it doesn't emphatically state that he prayed and sought the Lord and asked the Lord what to do, it does say that the Lord appeared unto him and gave him a special word. And you know what? In my study of the word, my own personal relationship with the Lord, you don't have encounters with the Lord dramatic like this without there being a receptiveness on your part. I mean, the Lord didn't just appear to everybody. This isn't a real common uh, occurrence. It's outside of the norm. And so I'm reading between the lines, but I really believe that Isaac, instead of just doing what everybody else did, and instead of going to Egypt because it was basically famine-proof, they had the Nile River and they did irrigation and stuff, and because of it, instead of just doing whatever it took and letting his uh, you know, own understanding take, take over... He, he began to seek the Lord. He was asking the Lord, God, what do you want me to do? And that's the reason that the Lord appeared unto him. There is a direct application of this to our situation. 
There are some people today who are struggling financially and they have fear about all of these things. And instead of just having a knee-jerk reaction and doing something and following what the, you know, the chicken littles that are crying that the sky is falling, what they're telling you to do and stuff, now is a wonderful time to get a word from God. Of course, we should do that all of the time. And let me just interject this again. I am not meaning to condemn or hurt anybody, but there are lessons to be learned in a situation like this. And one of them is that you ought to always be getting a word from the Lord. You know, my wife and I, we have, we don't have, you know, millions of dollars and stuff set aside and things like this, but we have some money. And we pray over what God wants us to do. And we've sought the Lord. And, and, you know, to my wife's credit, Uh, she felt, I forget the exact timing of this, I think it was around January or February of 2008, she just felt like that we ought to take, you know, the little bit of retirement that we had that was in, uh, in the stock market and that we ought to take that money out of the stock market and put it in a money market certificate. And so that's what we did. (laughs) Amen. And because of that, We didn't lose any of that money. Now, we got another little bit of money that a guy invest in the market, and we did lose some of that. So I haven't been totally immune to this. But I'm saying that, see, if you you are just listening to the Lord, and if God is speaking to you, God will show you things to do. And we shouldn't wait until there's a market crash and until there's fear running rampant in the streets before we turn to the Lord. We ought to live that way. If we would live that way, the Bible says in John chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit will show us things to come. And that's exactly what He did with my wife. He showed her exactly what to do, and it saved us a bundle of money. The last um, little statement that we've got, and it doesn't reflect totally all of the financial crisis, but the last little statement we've got, we've lost one thousandth of the money that we had invested. One thousandth. (laughs) It's not very much. And you know what? It's because we hear the voice of God. The scripture says in, I believe it's uh, Proverbs chapter 3, that uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Man, what a great promise. Trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding. You know, again, I am not saying this to rebuke or to hurt anybody, but if you have been severely burned and if you are in crisis, if you're one of those who got some kind of a mortgage to where the interest rate was real low, but in two years or five years, it just goes through the roof and now you're facing foreclosure or something. Again, I'm not saying this to trash you or to talk down to you, but you know what? That is contrary to the leading that God's Word gives us. You are mortgaging your future when you do things like that. And there's people that just, they don't think about the future. And yet the Scripture talks about this. It says before you go out to battle, you need to sit down and consider whether you have sufficient troops to handle the king that's coming against you. Before you build a house, consider whether you have enough to be able to make the payments and do what you need to do. The Scripture tells us those things directly. So... You should be listening to the Lord at all times, but if nothing else, even if you haven't in the past, if you've just gone with the current thinking and let the wisdom of this world direct you, now, instead of following their leading... Now, think about this. There are many of you that are in trouble because you've gone with the prevalent wisdom of the world. You've made unwise choices. You're in hock up to your ears. You've followed things that this is the way everybody else was doing it, and because... There were so many people doing it, you just went with the flow. Now, you may be having a financial crisis and you are going to follow the same people giving you instructions about what to do and how to pull out of everything and how to operate in fear. And you're going to listen to them, the same people that got you into this trouble. You know, if nothing else, listen to the Lord. I believe that that's what Isaac did in this midst of this situation, instead of just leaning to his own understanding, instead of just going down to Egypt, instead of taking the easy way out and just doing something out of panic, he heard the voice of the Lord. The Lord appeared unto him and spoke to him and told him not to go into Egypt. Don't follow the prevalent wisdom that everybody else was using. 
You know, if the Lord told him not to go into Egypt, it's because there was a, that thought was already there. Possibly there was lots of people already migrating and heading that direction. The Lord warned him against it and told him to dwell in that land. Now, he had the Lord appear unto him. You know what? We don't have to have the Lord appear unto us. Somebody might be saying, well, why not? Because we have the written Word of God. He didn't have a Bible. We do have a Bible. And in the Bible, there are so many promises. Scriptures about fear not, I am with you, I'm going to prosper you, I'll make what you set your hand unto to prosper. And there are just so many scriptures that talk about it's God that gives us power to get wealth. It's God who causes us to prosper. God will make us plenteous in goods. And on and on and on, all of these promises go. We have the written Word of God, so we don't have to have the Lord appear to us in a visible form or an audible voice out of heaven. We have the written, recorded Word of God. And according to the Scriptures in 2 Peter chapter 1, it trumps any visible or audible voice from God. The written Word of God is a more sure word of prophecy is what it says. And so we have scriptures from the Lord. And what I'm trying to encourage you to do is to look at the current situation through the eyes of the Word, through the eyes of faith, instead of letting this ungodly media system that we have that is exaggerating and overstating the issue is the polite way of saying it. And another way is that they're just flat out lying. They are twisting and manipulating the truth and telling you only the negative side of stuff and not anything positive. You know, I don't know how many of you remember, but just over a year ago, we got daily updates. I mean, daily updates about the war in Iraq and the cost and the number of people that were dying. And I mean, there was two or five or a dozen every day and they were showing us pictures and they were doing this because it was negative it was emotional, it grabbed people, it made their point, it fostered the points that they wanted to make. They were anti-war, they wanted the U.S. out of there, etc. And so it, it fit their paradigm and you just had a constant barrage of this. And then they had a troop surge and you know what? The war has turned and I don't even know the stats for sure because it's not being broadcast anymore. You'll go days, weeks a month without hearing a single thing. Now, a month doesn't have as many U.S. deaths as a single day used to. But you know what? They don't report the good news. They don't tell you anything that would make you feel good about it. They're reporting the negative for a specific purpose because negative news sells. I tell you, this I, it just really angers me the way that we are being manipulated there is propaganda, and of course, this program is being seen all around the world. And there are probably some of you in Russia and in England and in Africa and Australia and all of these different countries thinking about, boy, the news media in the U.S. must be really bad. Well, it is, and I'm not saying it's good. But I've been to those other places, and I'm telling you that it's the same thing. You are being manipulated. It's just human nature to gravitate towards the negative, to criticize things and not report anything good. There is so much good in this world. And just that statement that I made right there, there are some of you that kind of choke on that, like, oh man, there's a lot of bad. Well, there's no doubt that there's a lot of bad. I don't have my head in the sand like an ostrich hiding it and trying to ignore that there's problems. But there is so much good. There are so many wonderful things happening. There are people that are laying their lives down. You know, I've just been to Russia and I saw a whole group of our students that have moved over there and are giving their life and laying their life down and people's lives are being changed. And I mean dozens and dozens of people giving testimony to how their life has been completely changed. I've had people talk to me with tears in their eyes that they're, they'll just never be the same because there's people that are laying their life down and serving the Lord. There's great things. There's good things happening. And the sad thing is most of us all over the world aren't hearing it. They're just magnifying the negative. So I'm saying that instead of following this chicken little attitude, t saying that the sky is falling, instead of listening to them, you need a word from God. And I don't say this lightly. But I really believe that God is speaking through me right now 
to people all over the world that you have been hesitant. Your tendency is to draw back. Your tendency is to build a wall around yourself for protection and just try and hold on and ride this thing out and do stuff like that. I believe that if you would go to seeking the Lord and ask God for His wisdom, instead of listening to the pundits today that are just peddling fear and all of these things, ask God for a word. And if you'll do that, God is going to show some of you opportunities that you have never imagined before. I really believe that that's a word from the Lord. Some of you are going to begin to prosper. Some of you are going to see things happen. If you would just quit operating in fear and listen to God, God can show you a way through this situation. And not only just to survive, but you could thrive. You could come through this thing better than ever before. And what a testimony this would be. You know, later as we get into this story, Isaac prospered so much because he got a word from God and obeyed it that literally he was asked to leave a nation because he was greater in wealth and in goods than that entire nation. They saw the blessing of God. And later, that's those same people, Abimelech, came to him and he says, we see that now you are the blessed of the Lord. You know, our world needs to see some Christians today who instead of being bothered by the same things that the unbelievers are bothered by, instead of being under the same fear, instead of laying up at night wondering how you're going to make it, what happened to your retirement, what happened to your 401k, instead of being sad and defeated, they need to see you walk into the office whistling and praising God and still smiling and still showing compassion and still being a happy, productive person. The world needs to see some Christians who aren't bogged down and beat down by what's going on in the world. And you know what? They would recognize, you would stand out like a healed thumb if you started walking in faith instead of fear. That's the story right here with Isaac and that same thing needs to happen to us. And so the Lord told him in the last part of this second verse, he says, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. And then the next verse says, sojourn in this land. Boy, it was in the next sentence. Amen. <laughs> Didn't take long for the Lord to tell him where to sojourn. He says, sojourn in this land and I will be with thee and will bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto thy seed all of these countries and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments and statutes and my law. Man, here was a word from the Lord. Stay here. Stay where? Stay in a place that was experiencing famine. They were in drought. Did you know most people would say you can't prosper in a situation like that? You can if you have a word from God. And you know, there are some of you that are right on the verge of making decisions because of the fear and the unbelief that is rampant among unbelievers and you are about to make some decisions that you are going to leave the place where God told you to go. There may be some of you that have businesses, that have jobs, that have, you know, there could just be a million applications of this. But there are some of you that God led you to do something, and yet because of financial pressure, you're thinking of going somewhere else, doing something else. I'm telling you, if you have a word from God, you do what God told you to do, and you will prosper. You know, in this ministry right now, I'm doing what God told me to do. And even though, you know, God supplies my needs through the people who give, and in the natural, this is not a good time to be doing something and expanding. And, and the conventional wisdom would be, let's, let's contract, let's hold up, let's draw back from some of our plans because of the fear and all of these things that are being said. And yet God is speaking exactly the opposite to me. In the midst of a famine, in the midst of a financial crisis. And some people say, no, you can't do that. If God tells you to do it, you can do anything He tells you to do. You know, I remember a friend of mine that right after the September the 11th terrorist attacks, his daughter was going to Afghanistan to train in some kind of a deal. She was a doctor, and she was going there on some kind of a medical missionary thing. 
And then September the 11th happened, and I think it was just the very week after that, he called me with his daughter on the phone and says, tell her not to go. This is the hotbed of this terrorist thing. We may be in war. Tell her not to do this. And you know what I told him? I said she would be safer in the center of God's will than she would be staying here just because of something. If It just depends on whether God told her to go. If God told her to go, then go. You know, I remember one of our Bible college students didn't go with me on the first missions trip we took because her husband was afraid of her flying. So she stayed here and she died in a car accident right here in Colorado Springs. She would have been safer doing what the Lord called her to do. And so this young girl that I was talking to, she went to Afghanistan and everything worked out. You know, if God has told you to do something, just like me, I'm going to expand. We're going to sow and we're going to expect increase in a time of famine. And I know that that's what God is speaking to me. I believe that God is speaking this to people all around the world right now, that Christians rise up, step out in faith. Instead of shrinking back in fear and unbelief, take a step of faith. Boy, those are powerful, powerful statements. And so Isaac got a word from the Lord, and the Lord told him to stay in that land in a place where there was famine, in a place that it looked like failure was imminent. And I'm just saying that instead of going by circumstances, instead of letting the news media herd you in a certain direction, and instead of you just becoming one of the herd that goes along with everybody else and follows in the same fear and the same unbelief and and worry and care, you need to get a word from God. Even if the earth was to be removed, David said, I will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be cast into the sea. Nothing we're dealing with is remotely as bad as those scenarios, and yet David said, I'm not going to fear even if that happens. You know what? We should not be in fear. We ought to be trusting the Lord, and we ought to be getting a word from God. And brothers and sisters, let me just tell you that God wants to speak to you. John chapter 10, I won't take time to read all of those verses, but he said he's the shepherd of the sheep. The sheep hear his voice. They won't listen to another It's normal Christianity for us to hear from God. The Holy Spirit, John chapter 16, it says that the Holy Spirit will show us things to come. The Lord will show you what to do. The Lord will speak to you. Spend some time in the presence of God. Unplug from the bad news and read and listen to the good news as the Holy Spirit interprets it to you and brings it to your remembrance. Listen to the things that I believe God is trying to say through me to people who are about to panic and undo all of the good that you've been trusting God for. You need to get a word from God. If God has told you to stay in that place, and if it defies the conventional wisdom, then do what God tells you to do. And just like Isaac, you're going to see a supernatural harvest come out of this. And so the Lord promised him that he would do all of these things. Notice also in verse 5, this is Genesis 26, 5, he made it clear that this blessing was coming because Abraham had obeyed his voice and kept his charge and his commandments and statutes and laws. In other words, this wasn't happening to Isaac just because of who he was. It was because of his father and the covenant that he had. And did you know that there's a direct application of this to you and me? It's not all about you. It's not whether you've done everything right or not. When you put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you became a joint heir with Him. And you are blessed because of God's blessing upon Jesus. You know, I could spend an hour explaining this. I'm not going to do that. But let me just say quickly that the covenant that you have with God is really not between you and God directly. It's between God and Jesus And you, by faith in Jesus, have become a joint heir with Jesus. And the covenant is as sure and as lasting as uh, as Jesus is. He doesn't ever change because the covenant is made with Him. So therefore, you are a recipient of all of these blessings, not because you're the sharpest knife in the drawer, not because you do everything right, but because you are a joint heir with Jesus. It's because of your elder brother, the Lord Jesus, and your heavenly Father that this blessing is passed down upon you. Now, like I said, I could spend an hour amplifying on that because so many people let the devil just talk them out of things thinking, well, you messed up. You know, it's possible. I'm just coming up with a scenario here, but 
I, I gave this testimony that my wife heard from the Lord and we took the little bit of money that we had in the stock market, our retirement stuff, and, and she took that out and put it into a money market and into a really safe uh, deal. And because of it, we've lost very little money. And so you hear a testimony about that. The Bible says in John chapter 16, I believe it's verse 13, that the Holy Spirit will show us things to come. And you hear that and then you think, oh man, God was telling me to do this. I felt it. I knew I should have and I didn't obey. And many times you just think, well, I deserve everything I'm getting. And you just think, well, it won't work for me because I haven't done everything right. Do you know, Isaac didn't do everything right. Right after the Lord gave him this word. Now, he did do one thing right and that was he obeyed. Like in the sixth verse, it says, and Isaac dwelt in Gerar. That's what the Lord told him to do. The temptation was to go to Egypt where all the food was and the prosperity was. But instead, he went against natural logic. He went against the prevailing wisdom of his day and he obeyed God. But he didn't obey God perfectly. I'm not going to take time to read all of these verses, but in the next few verses you find that Isaac was afraid that somebody was going to try and kill him to be able to get to his wife, Rebecca. She was such a beautiful woman. And so Isaac actually lied and said, this isn't my wife, it's my sister. And this went on for a long period of time. And finally, one day, Abimelech uh, looked out a window and saw Isaac sporting with his wife, Rebecca. Uh, That's what it says in the last part of verse 8. Now, you know, the, the terminology here, he saw her sport, he saw... Isaac sporting with Rebekah. I don't know exactly what that means, but here's the reaction of Abimelech. It says in verse 9, Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife. So I don't know exactly what sporting is, but I can guarantee it's something you don't do with your sister. (laughs) You can tell that. Abimelech uh, figured it out real quickly that this was not just his sister, that this is bound to be his wife. And he called Isaac in and began to rebuke him. And did you know that Isaac was wrong in this? I believe that this is really something that is kind of an overflow or a result of Isaac's father, Abraham. Abraham twice did this exact same thing with Sarah, his wife, and he was reproved for it, and yet he continually did it. I mean, he was willing to let somebody else take his wife and commit adultery with her just so he could save his hide. I don't care how you slice that. It doesn't matter how you try and whitewash that. That was wrong. Isaac was wrong. And I don't know this for sure, but I've studied this and thought about it. I think he was unjustified in this fear. Because when Abimelech saw what had happened, he reproved Isaac and he says, What have you done? What could have possibly made you act this way? And Isaac told him, that he was afraid somebody had killed him trying to get to his wife. And Abimelech said, What is this that you have done unto us? One of the people might lightly have, ta- have lying with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all of the people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now Abimelech, the king's response, shows that he considered this great iniquity if somebody would have taken another man's wife and have had sexual relationships with her. And he uh, protected Isaac and Rebekah. And so his response to me is shows that there was more godliness, there was more of a sense of morality in that nation than what Isaac gave him credit for. I can't prove that, but you can't disprove it. Anyway, I believe it was totally wrong what Isaac did. He shouldn't have done this. And my point in bringing all of this up is to say that God gave Isaac a word not to go with the herd, not to do what everybody else did. Look at this negative situation and stay in a place that conventional wisdom would have said, don't do it. And yet at the word of the Lord, he obeyed. So there was cooperation on Isaac's part, but it wasn't perfect. He didn't do things perfectly. He got into fear about his wife and he did not do the right thing. And the significance of this is that you know what, maybe you haven't done everything just right. Maybe you didn't follow God's leading on your investments. Maybe you uh, took out mortgages that were, you know, these adjustable rate mortgages and you just forgot about the future and you mortgaged your future. Maybe you have 
gotten yourself in debt to the point that now you're in a crisis situation. And there's a tendency to just think, well, I did this to myself and God's going to let me stew in my juice. But no, here's Isaac who did something wrong. And yet God protected Isaac and God blessed him, not just because Isaac did everything right, but because of the covenant that God had established with Isaac's father and that had passed on unto him. And it's the same thing. God doesn't move in your life because you do everything right. God moves in your life because you have put faith in Jesus. And even if you've made mistakes, there's an opportunity here to learn something. There's an opportunity here to instead of just to go with what everybody else is doing is to stop, settle yourself down, be still, and know that He is God. Psalms 46.10 Listen to the voice of the Lord. Hear what God is telling you to do. And even if you've made mistakes, God will give you wisdom and guidance. I'm telling you in the name of the Lord, I really felt impressed to the Lord to share this with people, to go counter to our culture, to swim upstream against all of the negative things that are being said. I believe that God inspired this, and I believe that the reason for it is because there are some of you that because there is no voice, or certainly not very many voices out there saying, believe God, trust God, go for it. Instead, everybody's pushing the panic button and hitting the brake And there are some of you that if you will just respond to this and take this as a word from God, and if you will pray, God is going to show you some things that is... This is going to turn out to be one of the very best things that has ever happened in your life. There are some of you that are at a point right now where you can make adjustments and you can begin to start prospering financially, emotionally, in your marriage, in relationships, social things. God can bless you supernaturally, but you've got to get out of fear. It's like fear is this direction. Faith is this direction. They're opposites. And if you are running in fear, if you are listening to this world and following their guidelines and in fear, I guarantee you, you are not headed towards God. You are not running with God. God is not panicked. God is not sitting in heaven, wringing His hands and wondering, how am I ever going to pull the world out of this problem? (laughs) Amen. It just isn't happening. I remember back in the 80s when the interest rate was up to 20% and people were just, I mean, wailing and travailing and talking about where is this going? That's when we had the fuel shortages and people were sitting in their cars for hours trying to get gas at the pumps. And, you know, it just looked like Uh, everything was coming unraveled. And I remember back then thinking that God's my source and I didn't get bothered about all those kind of things. And you know what? We made it through that. The rest of the 80s began to be one of the greatest, uh, you know, extended periods of time of prosperity that this nation has ever known. And we made it through that. We're going to make it through this if you still yourself and listen to the Lord. And remember... Isaac is an example here. He didn't do everything right, but praise God, he did listen to the Lord. Let me use these verses out of Psalms chapter 67. And remember that Isaac had been in absolute fear and terror that somebody was going to kill him to be able to get to his wife. And look at these verses in Psalms chapter 67 and in verse 3. It says... Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Selah. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. You know, I believe that Isaac was operating in fear about somebody taking Rebekah, his wife. But when the Lord uh, delivered him from this threat and instead the the king granted his superior power uh, over that nation to Isaac and said, no man can touch this man or his wife. And when Isaac saw this happen and the Lord delivered him from all of his fears, you know what I believe the result was? Isaac went to praising God. And what happens when you praise God? We just read these verses, but specifically 
in verse uh, 6, it says, Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. It's talking about after you praise God. When Isaac was delivered from this negative situation, I just know in my heart that Isaac began to start thanking and praising God for his faithfulness and his mercy because Isaac did the wrong thing. This wasn't right about him not standing up for his wife. In the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says that, you know, the man is supposed to lay down his life for his wife and he's, he's supposed to protect her and do all of these things. Isaac wasn't doing that. Isaac failed as a husband and yet God blessed him. And when he saw this, I can just imagine that Isaac erupted in praise and according to this verse, when you praise God, then the earth yields its increase. And you know what happened over here in Genesis chapter 26 and in verse 12 it says, Then Isaac sowed in that land. It Notice it says then. This is after this great deliverance, after God had set him free, after Isaac had started praising and thanking God for his intervention. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. And again, this is exactly what was prophesied in Psalms chapter 67. It says, Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase. And God, even our own God, shall bless us. This is nearly word for word exactly what is recorded over here in Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. If you would quit operating in fear and speaking forth doubt and unbelief and negativism and worry and fear, if we would depart from that and instead start praising God, start praising God for all of the promises that God is going to take care of you, that God is your source, that God is the one who prospers you. If we would get into the Word and put our confidence in the Lord and start praising Him, even in a time of famine, even in a time of financial crisis, if we would go to praising God, I guarantee you when you praise God, then the earth yields or increase. You know, it's hard to get a hundredfold return off of a seed that you sow, even if it isn't a time of famine. I mean, the Scripture says over there in Mark chapter 4 that there's 30, 60, and 100-fold return. 100-fold is the best. That's at the top. That's the, that's the highest return. And yet, Isaac received 100-fold in a time of famine. Why? Because he had started praising God. He had obeyed God. He had gotten a word from God. He submitted to it, not perfectly. He did some things wrong. And when he saw the mercy of God extended towards him, he began to praise and thank God and the earth brought forth its increase and God blessed him. I'm saying to you in the name of the Lord, I really believe this. This is a word from God for you. That if you would not just follow the crowd, if you wouldn't just listen to the fear mongers, to the chicken littles talking about the skies falling, if you would get hold of these promises of God's Word that He's going to prosper whatever you set your hand unto, that God is your source, that God is going to bless you. I don't care what the economy does. I don't care what the world talks about. If you had your faith fixed in God and if you were praising God and operating in praise instead of fear and doubt and unbelief, you would prosper. God would cause you to receive a hundredfold return. Brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in the name of the Lord. This is God speaking directly to some of you. And God is trying to get you to trust Him. Get a word from God. Find out what God told you to do. Set your hand unto it. Make sure you're doing what God told you to do. And you will prosper in a year of famine. In a time of financial downturn when everybody else is giving up, you can prosper. I really believe that's the Lord speaking to you. So He sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And in verse 13 it says, And the man, talking about Isaac, waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. In verse 13, notice it says that the man waxed great. You know what this word is talking about? This is a word picture. I don't know if any of you have ever made candles. I've personally not made a wax candle, but I've been to these places where they show you how they were made 100 or 200 years ago. And I remember they'll take a vat of wax and they'll heat it until it's liquid. 
And then they just have a wick hanging from something. And I've seen it where they'll have 50 wicks on a stick. And, and this machine just dips it down into the wax and lifts it up. And it, and it stays out for about a, a second or so. And in that one second, the cold air hitting this wax forms a little uh, coating over that wick. And then it dips it again. And it just keep, this is the way they used to make candles. They would just dip them over and over and over and over. And every time they would put another layer until eventually they had a candle, and that's the way that they used to make candles. This is talking about that Isaac waxed great. And what this is talking about is that it didn't just happen one time. It wasn't just a one-time investment. It wasn't just something where you go out and get some kind of a, you know, a stock that is just going uh, on public display, and you buy it, and it becomes the next uh, Google or something like that. It's See, this is one of the problems that people have with prosperity is that they're always looking to win the lottery. <laughs> Man, they have a lottery mentality. And I'm going to say some things here that I know is not going to bless some of you, but it's the truth. And I tell you, if you haven't wised up by now, a lot of people's thinking about prosperity is the reason that they're having trouble and that the reason they're in this. But the statistics show that over 80% of people who buy lottery tickets are what is called the uh, poor. And you know what it is? People who have money, people who succeed, recognize that a lottery mentality, it, it just doesn't work. There is one out of 430 million or whatever that is going to win the lottery. The odds are stacked against you. I can guarantee you if there was any other kind of business transaction, you know, if there was only one out of 430 million chances that you could ever survive this illness, well, then nobody would expect to survive it. But when it comes to the lottery, people just think, oh, man, I'm going to do this and I'm going to strike it rich. And there's people that spend hundreds and thousands of dollars buying lottery tickets. You know, I, again, I'm not saying these things to hurt anybody. I'm trying to enlighten you, but I'm saying winners don't do stuff like that. People who prosper God's way do not go out and buy lottery tickets. I'm not saying you're of the devil. I'm not saying it's sin if you buy a lottery ticket, but I'm saying it's a mindset that's against what God's Word says. This scripture, and there's many, many scriptures, show that, Abraham, uh, that Isaac waxed great. It wasn't a one-time deal. This wasn't the only time he did something that was right. He just consistently kept serving God and obeying and listening to the voice of God. And he sowed in the place that God told him to. And basically, the way you prosper, here's a real simple formula for becoming rich. You spend less money than you make, and you do that over and over and over and over and over for a long period of time. And you know what? It may take a decade, two decades, five decades, but eventually you are going to see prosperity come your way if you spend less than you make. That's the way it works. But you know what? In our culture, there is credit available, zero interest and, of course, there is nothing free. If they offer you zero interest, then that means when the interest, you know, for a year, well, then when the interest finally kicks in, boy, you are going to pay through the nose. Like cars, if you go out, and this is, this is andeology. I can't show you a scriptural verse for this, but this is something that I've lived by. But if you go out and buy a car on credit, and if you get that car on credit for more than three years, the odds of that car still being in good working condition and still functioning well at, at, you know, into four and five and six years diminish rapidly. And uh, the, the chances of you, if you get a five-year or a six-year loan on that car, the chances of you having that car give up and you have to go replace it and get another one and you could still be making payments on a car that isn't even working properly or that is wrecked or something, it is just not prudent. If you can, you shouldn't get a car on credit in the first place, but if you have to get a car on credit, well, at least get one that you aren't going to have to go over three years out. But see, people will offer you, well, it's 60 months, and that lessens your payments. But if you add all of this up, did you know at the end of the 60 months, you're going to pay for that car two or three times over because of credit? And people just look at it, well, the monthly payment is low. 
Well, that's because they're getting all of this interest spread out over the time. You would be better off to have a higher payment, to get a lesser car to get down to the payment that you can afford and get a loan for two years, three years max. But see, people just, they don't have this mindset about the future. They're just right now. What can I get? Oh, they're going to give it to me interest-free for a year. And so they take it. They don't make any payments. They don't set any money back. They don't do anything. And then a year from now, they are gambling that everything's going to be better, and it may not be. And then all of a sudden, you've got an asset that you now have to pay for, and it's all come due in a balloon payment, and you put yourself under the gun. Brothers and sisters, that's just, uh, well, it's just stupid. I don't know a better way of saying that. And I'm not against anybody, but I'm saying that, see, the scripture here says that Isaac waxed great. You know, I could make a million applications of this. In our ministry, there are people that see me right now. There's Bible college students that come, and they see us prospering, and they see us doing things, and we're traveling the world and on television all over the world, and people's lives are being changed, and they see this, and so, man, they're just wanting to jump right in and start experiencing this. And they don't realize that I've been in ministry for 40 years and I've been through my lean times. And I just year after year after year kept doing what God told me to do and making a little bit of progress and adding step by step, layer by layer. I have waxed into where I've got increased influence and where I'm ministering to people. It happens over a period of time. But this lottery mentality to where you can just sit there and violate all of the laws of prosperity... You don't follow the prudent things. You're sitting there on the couch just watching stuff, not seeking the Lord, not praying, not doing anything, and you're just someday your ship's going to come in and you never sent one out. You haven't been giving. You haven't been doing what the Lord told you to do. I'm telling you that that welfare lottery mentality is a prosperity killer. This says that Isaac waxed great and he went forward. You know what that means? He kept moving in the direction that God was leading him. He had a goal. He kept progressing. He wasn't standing still. He was doing something. You know, it's amazing when you start doing something, anything, how God can prosper that. The Scripture says that He will bless what you set your hand unto, that He will give you a hundredfold return. But if you set your hand unto nothing, a hundred times zero is zero. And I meet people all of the time who are looking for a job, but they're wanting a CEO position. They're wanting some great position. And until they get it, they're just sitting at home doing nothing, collecting welfare and complaining about why aren't they able to prosper. You know what? I don't, I don't think it's wrong for you to desire a better job and a CEO position and stuff like that. Go for it. But in the meantime, set your hand unto something. Go work at McDonald's. Go get a job doing anything. And you know what? If I was in a position where I had to go out and work, if I worked at McDonald's, I can guarantee you because of my faith in God and my work ethic and my positive attitude, I would be believing God. And that I would either get me another job someplace or I would own that McDonald's. And I guarantee you, you start owning a McDonald's and own a few of them and you could be a wealthy person. But there's a lot of people that, well, that'd just be below me. I don't want to start there. You've got to go forward. You've got to do something. You wax great. You don't sit home waiting on just some kind of a miracle to happen. Man, this is powerful. You know, I'm speaking to a lot of people right now who maybe you have succumbed to some of these financial deals and you are just looking for some kind of a miraculous intervention. There's a number of things that you could learn if you've had hardship during some of these financial problems. And one of those is that, you know what, there isn't a quick fix. I've got a friend that I love dearly, one of my very best friends, but this guy, I think one of the mistakes that he's made is he's always looking for a deal that's going to bring in billions and even trillions of dollars. He's dreaming big, and in a way, that's good. But at the same time, this guy started in ministry just about the same time I did. You know what? And he has a good word. He's got a revelation from God. There's no reason that he shouldn't be prospering and reaching people and and doing as much as what I'm doing. And yet, he struggles financially. He's in trouble. 
And one of the reasons is because he's always looking for the lottery. He's always looking for the one thing that's going to push him over. And instead of just doing a little by little and waxing great, he's just looking for a one-time deal. This is one of the things you need to learn through this. There are some of you that have taken your life savings, you've taken everything, and you've gambled, and you've, you've looked for something. You know, one of the things that you need to learn is that you need to diversify. Look at just the next few verses here. It says in Genesis chapter 26, in verse 13 again, This man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great, for he had possession of flocks and possessions of herds and store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. You know, one of the things that that verse says is that he had diversity. It wasn't all flocks. It wasn't all herds. It wasn't all servants. And we can tell by the context in the previous verses that he also was a husbandman and he sowed, or excuse me, a farmer, and he sowed seed and reaped a hundredfold. So Isaac was doing a lot of different things. There's some people that put all of their eggs in one basket. They just do one thing. They are looking, and man, if the slightest little thing happens, they're in trouble. That's not wisdom. You know, these are some of the lessons that we can learn through this, and they're right here in Scripture. Isaac waxed great. He went forward. He was still moving. He was still doing what God told him to do. And notice it says he grew until he became very great. There is a period of time. One of the things that I teach our students, one of the very first lessons that we have on the integrity of the Word in the first year classes is out of Mark chapter 4. There's a parable there about a man who cast his seed into the ground and it says he sleeps and rises night and day and he doesn't know how it works, but the earth brings forth fruit of itself. First the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. And what that's teaching is that there are steps, stages to increase. You don't put your seed in the ground and then the next day, boom, here's a full crop with all of the fruit on it. No, it takes a period of time. And you get first a little blade and then the ear and then the full corn in the ear. And you know what? There's a growth. There's steps and there's stages. And this doesn't only apply to farming, but it applies to ministry. It applies to relationships. It applies to prosperity, financial prosperity. It applies to wisdom, anything. It's just a key to the kingdom of God that there's steps and stages. You have to wax great. You have to keep seeking God. You have to do things little by little. And this whole mentality of where you're going to get something, just boom, here it comes, it's, it's an ungodly concept. You know, here in the Colorado Springs area, we have some limited stakes gambling out in uh, Cripple Creek, Colorado. And uh, when that first opened up, I actually had a number of our Bible college students that were going out there and gambling. And they didn't spend large amounts of money. It wasn't like they were losing everything on it. But there was people that would go out there and when it came time to pay their tuition, they'd take what little money they had and they'd go gamble and just hope that they could uh, win something, you know, and they'd pray over it. And I had to get up and actually teach on this. And I hadn't got these scriptures in front of me, but there are many scriptures that says wealth gotten by vanity takes away the life of the owners thereof. In other words, that's saying that there is a right way to get wealth and a wrong way. If you get it the wrong way, it takes away your life. It says in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, that uh, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and He adds no sorrow with it. God can prosper you, but you can also prosper through ungodly means. And anyway, without me going into a whole teaching on it, the whole concept behind gambling where you put one dollar down and you get five thousand back, it's an ungodly concept. God is never going to bless that. God is not going to rig the lottery for you. He's not going to make slot machines work for you. That is not God's system. (laughs) And I know some of you are just shocked and really disappointed. But I'm telling you that this is not how you prosper. And the reason that we're in this financial crisis is because people ignored these very things that I'm talking about from Scripture. And they went out thinking that, well, you know, just mortgage yourself up to the hilt. If they'll give me the mortgage and if, you know, there are actually loans that they're making where you just pay the interest and don't pay any principal. Now that is stupid. Just forgive me for being blunt, but how dumb can you get and still breathe? If you bought a $100,000 house, which would be a cheap house nowadays, and all you do is pay the interest, 
that's just crazy. You're going to wind up paying a million dollars, ten times what it's worth. You shouldn't be doing stuff like that. But see, that's people who are just ignoring these sound biblical principles. They aren't doing anything. They aren't spending less than they're making. They're just because somebody will give it to you. Mortgage your future. Put yourself in, in jeopardy. And this is what's happening today. This is a needed correction. We needed the bottom to fall out because there are people making so many stupid decisions that, you know what, it, we needed to come back to reality. We needed a dose of reality. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you can prosper, but not the way that this world is trying to do it. You don't do it through mortgaging yourself up to the hill, mortgaging your future, mortgaging your kid's future. There are right and wrong ways to prosper And Isaac did it correctly. He got a word from God. He went against the flow. He was swimming upstream. While everybody was headed down to Egypt, he stayed there and he sowed in a land in a year of famine because he had a word from God. He praised God and the earth gave its increase and God blessed him and he waxed great over a period of time because he just kept doing what God told him to do. You know, I know that there are some of you that God has led you And you've stepped out and done some things. And right now, because of the financial crunch, some of you are considering throwing in the towel, going another direction, giving up on your dreams and stuff. I'm telling you, that's the way that the world thinks. If God has spoken to you, you need to make sure that what you're doing is really directed by God and that it wasn't your own flesh and it wasn't a disobedience to God. But if you are doing what God has told you to do, You need to keep doing it. You need to trust God. You need to get out of just floating downstream with everybody else. And you need to turn around and start going against the current. Start praising God and confessing that God is your source. Make sure that it's God you trust in and not just the economic system. And if you would do that, and if you keep doing it, if you keep moving in that direction going forward, you will grow and you will wax great and you will see God prosper you. It is not a lottery mentality to where you just roll the dice and all of a sudden, boom, you prosper. And it is amazing to me how many people think that way. It's amazing to me how many Christians have that kind of an attitude and they're just wanting God to somehow or another just wave his wand over them and they prosper. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, it says, But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that giveth you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant as it is this day. God doesn't give you money. It doesn't say that God gives you money. It says God gives you the power to get money, to get wealth. God gives you an anointing. And you have to go out and work it. You have to set your hand unto something. You have to start doing it. You have to produce more than you consume and do that consistently over a lifetime. And I guarantee you, any person who will do that will be prosperous. But the problem is there's a lot of people that are spending more than they're making and they have this lottery mentality that they aren't using wisdom and they know that there is a a cliff that they're headed for and they're just praying that somehow or another God delivers them before their arm, their adjustable rate mortgage increase before the last payment's due or whatever. And they're out there using unsound business practices. And I tell you, there needs to be an adjustment. And what we see is just a natural adjustment to all of this greed and selfishness and indulgence and stuff. And there needs to be a change. And so, anyway, this is what we've been talking about. God doesn't give you money. He gives you an ability, a power to get money, and you can prosper, but you've got to be like Isaac. You've got to hear the voice of the Lord. You've got to be willing to go against the crowd while everybody was deserting Gerar and going to Egypt. Isaac stayed in a place that other people were forsaking, used their own ground, <laughs> man, and sowed his seed in their ground because they had deserted the place because it was a famine and he got a hundredfold return. Boy, there's great applications. Look at this in Genesis chapter 26, verse 14. It says, For he, speaking of Isaac, had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. Notice that when it's talking about his prosperity, it's mentioning things that appreciate flocks 
reproduce. Sheep have, you know, baby sheep. Herds have calves. Servants, people have more servants. All of these are appreciating assets. If you want to prosper, you need to quit putting so much money into depreciating items such as cars. You know, you can go buy a fifty, sixty thousand dollar car, drive it off the lot, and it'll lose ten to twenty thousand dollars in two days. <laughs> that may not bless you, but that's the way that it is. I guarantee you, those are depreciating assets. You have to keep a car for 20 or 30 years until it becomes a classic before it begins to increase in value. That's a depreciating asset. Now, you have to have a vehicle to get around in, but you know what? You could use wisdom in some of this and not sink so much money into a depreciating asset. Televisions. And praise God, I'm glad that you've got a television to be watching me. I'm not saying that they are something that... It's wrong and you shouldn't have one. I'm saying you shouldn't watch everything that's on it. There's not that much good. But you know what? A television set, you buy those things, those are depreciating assets. Much of the computer stuff that we buy, we spend so much money on all of these things and in a year or two, it's obsolete. I actually, you know, back when we were buying our own computers to run the ministry, I spent $60,000 on a computer system to run this ministry, and I think it was either two or three years, it was so slow and outdated that they wanted to update it. And I grudgingly bought a new one and updated it. And I said, what are we going to do with the old one? And they said, well, you could use it for a boat anchor. And I said, that was $60,000. And you're telling me that all it's good for is a boat anchor? And they said, it's obsolete. Who would want it? You know what? You need to start putting your money into things that appreciate instead of depreciate. And this is one of the things about Lot right here. Notice, as it mentions his prosperity, he had flocks which appreciate, possession of herds which appreciate, great store of servants which appreciate. And it notice it says the Philistines envied him. How many of us can say that unbelievers envy us? You know, I haven't arrived in this area, but I've left. And I can tell you that I've had people uh, for about 12 years, I had people buy me cars. And they didn't buy cheap cars. They bought nice cars. They were gifts. I didn't spend my money on it. People gave me these cars. And I've actually had unbelievers before comment on my car. And I said, oh, this was a gift. And I, I remember one guy... I was getting feed for my horses and stuff, and he saw, and he just couldn't believe that. And I, he says, man, you think God would do that for me? And you know what? I have seen people look at the blessings of God in my life and envy me. Now, I'm not saying that I gloat in that and that I'm trying to make other people envious, but I am saying that, you know what? There ought to be a tangible evidence of the blessing of God in our life. During this economic downturn, crisis, whatever you want to call it, there's some lessons that you ought to learn. And just like I've been saying, you need to recognize that you have to wax great, that there are certain principles you need to follow. You need to do things over and over and over. You need to get appreciating items. And if you will do this, then you'll find out that the unbelievers will begin to start seeing the blessing of God in your life. Instead of you operating in fear, if you are speaking faith, if you are talking about the goodness of God and talking about, man, how this is a great time, you are excited about the future, you're going to stand out like a heel thumb. And I guarantee you the unbelievers will notice it. And they'll take notice. And it could be a tremendous deal. You could see people born again. You could see people's lives changed by you just beginning to operate in this. That's what happened with Isaac right here. And here's another point in chapter, in verse 15 of Genesis 26, it says, For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And you know, for time's sake today, I'm not going to read all of these scriptures, but basically Isaac uh, experienced rejection and criticism because of the blessing of God in his life. You know, if you truly begin to prosper... And if people see the blessing of God, there'll be one of two reactions. People will either see the blessing of God and they will come and entreat your favor and want your blessing and want you to pray for them and help them. 
That happened right here in the next verse. It says in verse 16 that Abimelech, that which was the king of Gerar, came unto Isaac and said, Go from us, for thou art much greater than we. He recognized the blessing and prosperity of God on him. And then later it says that Abimelech came and... Um, in verse 26, uh, went unto him, and in verse 27, Isaac said, Wherefore are you come to me, seeing you hate me and have sent me away from you? And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee, and we said, Let us uh, let there be now an oath betwixt us, even between us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou doest no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good." and have sent thee away in peace, thou art now the blessed of the Lord. These very people who had asked him to leave because he, he was more prosperous than their entire nation, these same people came and entreated his favor and wanted to make a covenant with him. So this is, there's two reactions. You'll get some people who will respond positively and want you to pray for them and want you to share with them how they could prosper and, and they want to uh, you know, benefit from the blessing of God on your life. The other response is like these Philistines who envied him and they went and filled up his wells and they began to persecute him and they tried to make his way hard and stop his prosperity. This always happens because people uh, are primarily insecure. They are not wanting to change and when they see you prospering during a time of famine, when everybody else is pushing the panic button, and you are going forward, and you're prospering, and God is meeting your needs, and you're able to take a vacation, and they're so fearful that they can't get off because the gas prices are high or because they're afraid of this or that, and you're doing things. You know what? People will either respond positively and ask you to pray for them, and, and they'll admire you for it, or there's people that'll come out and criticize you because they can't rise up to your level. They're fearful that that would never work for them. And so rather than sit there and have you be a stark contrast to them showing that they aren't living uh, all of the abundance that God has available, the easiest thing for them to do is tear you down. So they go to attacking you and they go to criticizing you in hopes that they can tear you down and discredit you and therefore take away the conviction that they're feeling by the way that you're prospering. You know, some of you may think that's an oversimplification, but I believe that that's really at the root of everything. It says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, it says, only by pride comes contention. It didn't say that this is a leading factor or one of the major factors. It says only thing that causes contention is pride, self-centeredness, looking at things from a selfish standpoint. When these people begin to start filling up these wells and attacking Isaac, it was because... They were self-centered. They were thinking, well, what about us? This man is in our country as a foreigner, and here he is prospering more than us. They were envious. They were jealous. It says in James 3.16, where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Man, this is an inroad of Satan into people's lives. And so Isaac... As the blessing of God came upon him, there also became persecution and rejection. And you know, this is exactly what the Scriptures prophesied. Uh, Jesus told His disciples in Mark chapter 10, He says, There is no man that hath left house, or father, or mother, or brother, or sister, or lands for My sake, but that he shall receive a hundredfold in this life, all of those things, and persecution, and in the world to come, everlasting life. The Lord talked about there being a hundredfold return in this life. Blessing and prosperity on us, but he said, with persecution. You know what? If you are going to do things God's way, I can guarantee you somebody's going to criticize you for it. Somebody's going to come out against you. If you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed the same direction. When you turn around and start swimming upstream, you are going to be criticized. People will come out against you. And so there's somebody that says, well, I don't want that. Well, what would you want? Do you want to just be miserable like everybody else? Do you want to reap what everybody else is reaping? You know, it's amazing to me how many people want the positive results that the Word of God promises, but they don't want to do what the Word says. They don't want to suffer any criticism. And there are a lot of people that honestly would rather just be like everybody else, even though everybody else is miserable, Every, even though people are operating in fear, they're panicking. 
They would rather be with the herd, miserable, than to be over here blessed and having somebody criticizing you. You know, I use those scriptures out of Isaiah chapter 51, where he says, Who are you that a man would terrify you and that you would respond to this and forget me, the maker? You know, when you let the people's criticism manipulate you and control you and motivate you to do something, you can whitewash that any way you want to, but you know what you've done? You have forgotten the Lord. You aren't trusting in God. I'm not saying these things to be critical of anybody, but I'm trying to open up our eyes. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to the to this physical world system, it's like most people have a spiritual side, their Sunday side, that they trust God when they go to church. They pray about certain things. But when it comes down to money, when it comes down to your retirement, when it comes down to the basics of life, Most people's trust is in this monetary system, and when that goes sideways, when things aren't working, boy, you are hearing people push the panic button, scream and cry wolf, say the sky is falling, and it reveals that their trust isn't really in God. I'm telling you that God is the one that you should be trusting, not only in a crisis time, but you should be trusting God all the time. If we would follow His guidelines, if we would have been using the principles in the Word of God where He says, Oh, no man anything but to love one another. You know, if we were to follow those principles, I guarantee you, you, you could just be uh, famine-proofed. You could be crisis-proofed. You know, my wife and I, and I hesitate to say this because I am not saying this in any way to criticize anybody else. But my wife and I have been operating in godly principles in in the area of finances. Boy, we give a large portion of our income. We always spend less than we bring in. We use wisdom and things. And anyway, by the grace of God, we have a house that is completely paid for. We don't know anything on it. We've got three vehicles. I got four vehicles if you count my skid loader that I have to use to maintain my property. And you know what? They're all paid for. I don't owe any man anything because we've been operating in this. And so you know what? Who cares what the world system is doing? Who cares about what they're saying? I do not. I am not locked into this world system. You don't have to live the way that everybody else does. You know, I don't know how to get this across any any better than what I'm doing. And I know that there's many of you thinking, well, boy, you just need to go back to preaching the Bible. I am preaching the Bible. These are scriptural principles. And some people say, well, you just need to stay over there and talk about eternity and eternal values and what's going to happen in heaven. You know what? If If the principles of faith And if trusting God only work on Sunday morning, only work in certain situations, but if you can't apply it, if it's not practical, if it doesn't work in your life, then it makes me wonder whether you got the real deal. You know what? When I started trusting God, I trust God across the board in every area of my life. To the best of my ability, I'm trying to follow these instructions, and I'm telling you, I'm saying this in love, but if you would operate in God's system, If you would put God first, man, I'm praying that if you are in a financial bind in the name of Jesus, don't quit giving. Don't stop your giving. There's a lot of people that only give when it's convenient. I tell you, if you're going through a tough time, you need to increase your giving. You need to put some seed in the ground. Don't eat it all or you're going to be hungry in the future. I'm telling you, don't panic. Start operating in faith. Trust God. Sow in a year of famine. And if you'll do that and take this as being a word from the Lord, just like what Isaac did, I can guarantee you God is going to prosper you. This can be one of the greatest times in your life. And there needs to be adjustment. Our financial situation has just been totally out of hand. And you know what? There can be positive things come out of this. You can learn lessons that will set you well the rest of your life. And whatever you've lost, if you've lost something, God can give it back to you if God is your source. I just want to challenge you. If you would turn to the Lord and if you would truly call out to Him, the Lord will prove Himself to you. 
In Malachi chapter 3, I believe it's verse 10, it says, Bring all of the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you shall not have room enough to receive it. You know, there's very few things. That's really the only thing I, I can think of in the Bible where the Lord says, Prove me. Try it. See if it doesn't work. Most of the things, it's just a command. He's God. We aren't. He tells us what to do, and you either comply or don't comply. But when it came to this area of finances, the Lord says, try it. Prove it. See if it won't happen. There may be some of you that think, well, this is just too good to be true. Man, to be insulated like what I'm describing to where regardless of what happens in the world, you are going to have a confidence and a trust and a security in the Lord, regardless of what the world system does, regardless of what the political system does, this just can't be so. You know, I hear the Lord saying, try it. Prove Him. Step out. Begin to start just seeking God. Ask God to help you. Instead of operating in fear, pray and ask God to speak to you and show you what to do. And I promise you, if you in a sincere heart do that, and step out. God is going to reveal Himself to you, and I am saying in the name of the Lord that you are going to prosper in a year of famine. You are going to see God prosper you, and this can be one of the greatest things in your life. You could look back at whatever failure, whatever difficulty you've had, and you could say, praise God, that was the thing that caused me to recognize that I needed something bigger than myself to trust in. And you know what? This could be a great time for you to turn and put all of your trust and reliance in God. I promise you God will meet your need. And I pray that you'll receive this as a word from God and act on it. And if you'll do that, then God's no respecter of persons. Just like Isaac, you can sow in a time of famine and reap a supernatural harvest. Praise God.